The Fed pivot is now officially the Powell pushback. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Boston. I like the alliteration. Like yes, that? I do. I'm all about alliteration. I spent like 20 minutes. I, I dig yeah. it. I'm Alex Steele. We're taking, kicking you off to the closing bell here in New York. All right, so I got to say, equities well off the lows of their session. In fact, they really had a nice comeback. I mean, at one point, we were down by about eight-tenths of 1% uh, on some better economic data, right? Though the worst performing sector within the S&P, though, I think is quite interesting. It's S&P materials off by 2% because of Air Products. It's a chemical company, globally diversified, but their China outlook was really poor, and that, to me, raises a lot of question marks as to the health of the global economy. Now, what's so interesting is that you have equities sort of flat, but you have yields really backing up, particularly in the front end. you got two-year yields up 10 basis points over the last two days, we're looking at 26 basis point move in the two year. Have not seen that uh, since last March. And lo and behold, the dollar is stronger. So you have a dollar stronger, yields higher, yet equity is holding in Romaine. I don't know. Does one plus one still equal two? I don't think so. I think it needs to, well, it's maybe like three and a half. I mean, you go back to the Treasury moves, there really has been no reason for U.S. Treasuries to rally and every reason for them to sell off. This after Jay Powell makes clear once again, that rate cuts aren't coming anytime soon. Remember, it was just four weeks ago when a March rate cut was viewed as almost a near certainty by investors. But Powell's press conference on Wednesday and that CBS interview that he taped on Thursday, reiterating more economic data is needed to confirm inflation is headed back down to the Fed's 2 percent target. Rate cut bets today for March, at least plunging bond market volatility for today spiking. And the week is still young. Remember, we got a big slate of nine Fed officials speaking, including Susan Collins, Michelle Bowman, as well as Tom Barkin. And while Fed officials may appear to be on the same page, the economic signals are not. An ISM services number showing prices paid for materials jumping the most since 2012. And that came on the same day as more U.S. companies announced thousands of more job cuts. Estee Lauder saying today it's getting rid of as much as 5% of its global staff. Snap planning a 10% reduction in headcount. And just last week, you had Zoom Video shed 2% of its workforce. That was actually shedding them that week alone. And then the software company Okta said it would eliminate 7% over the next few weeks. Layoffs now being mentioned on U.S. earnings calls at the highest rate since the second quarter of 2020, according to a Bloomberg analysis. For now, though, most employees don't actually seem worried. The latest MLive Pulse survey showing more than half of the respondents see their household spending holding strong this year, undeterred, Alex, by mounting credit card bills or those mounting layoff announcements. Is it because they're invested in the S&P? I don't know. Or maybe, perhaps Treasury bills. Or maybe and it's all gold good. under the bed. <laughs> or the gold in the soup cans yeah. under the bed. I have a couple of butts to all of this. So take a look at this. Romain was just talking about it. This is the ISM services index we see here. Nice jump over 53. The issue, though, that I have is the price is paid index uh, jumping the most since 2012. Uh, and you're looking at jumping to 64. So at some point, things get more expensive. Therefore, you stop buying it. One other thing that I had question marks on was the SLU's data. It's a senior loan officer survey from the Fed. I love this data point, And it does show tightening lending standards and weak demand for consumer loans, auto loans, home loans. So you just have to wonder if we're in kind of a bifurcated economy where certain people, certain income levels are feeling pretty good. Everyone else, though, doesn't, which is kind of what we do see with some of the survey data. Romaine. Absolutely. Let's uh, kick things off here with Constance Hunter, senior advisor over at Macro Policy Perspectives. As we count you down to those closing bells, just a little bit less than an hour to go. And Constance, you heard what Alex ended on here, and it really raises a broader question about the view of the economy. We talk so much about the health of the economy as if it's sort of this set thing that we all sort of agree on, yet we've seen there's a big divergence in the data and a big divergence in opinion. Yeah, so a few things to note. I mean, first of all, at times of inflection points in economic trajectories, we do see conflicting data. And so um, I think that's why you're seeing caution out of the Fed. They wanna be very sure that prices are on that downward trajectory. We do believe that they're gonna see their 2% uh, before the May meeting, but nevertheless, data points like this ISM piece of data are concerning um, when we look at price pressures uh, on prices paid. Now the question is, will companies pass those on to consumers? Will consumers have the same appetite to uh, accept higher prices? 
And are companies going to be helped by productivity gains elsewhere mm -hmm. that allow them to maintain healthy margins without passing those costs on to consumers? We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the productivity side of it, because I've heard this from a lot of our guests here, that this could actually be the real wild card, at least in determining whether valuations in the market are justified. This idea that instead of looking at some of the more traditional metrics, that you now need to start looking at the prices of these companies based on some of their productivity improvements, or at least the promise of productivity improvements? Yeah, so I guess I'll start that conversation by saying productivity in an individual company is not at all the same as productivity economy-wide, right? Um, so what may cause a productivity improvement, for example, at a certain company, let's take Estee Lauder, which announced layoffs today, um, does not necessarily produce productivity economy wide because those people aren't working that they that they hi that they lay off and then they're not spending and so we don't have a higher economic growth necessarily unless they get new jobs. Uh, when we look at productivity economy wide, we're looking at a number of different factors, right? So the first thing that helped productivity was the fact that we had a decline in some of the um, drag on productivity from supply chain issues that's gone away. In addition, we've had very, very robust investment coming out of this um, recession. And so this is one of the strongest investment expansions we've had over the last 50 years. And that is giving way to increased productivity. We also have a very high number of new business formations and high propensity new business formations. Yeah. New businesses are not encumbered by existing technology. They adopt brand new uh, technology. And so they're more uh, productive and more efficient. And then finally, we have this labor hoarding that's going on. And we all know um, from being in jobs ourselves, right, that the longer you're in a role, the more productive you are at an individual company. We yeah. know that job switching causes friction, right? So, so, so sort of a an unexpected consequence of this labor hoarding that we're seeing is we're seeing productivity numbers rise. And so, uh, and it, and of course, the last uh, two quarters of data have seen very, very strong productivity growth. So, uh, so, so yeah. I think it's a driver of growth for the for the coming year, at least, if not several years. So, Constant, we've heard from a, a bunch of Fed officials and the Fed chair himself for the last couple of days, and everyone with the same kind of message, right? Like, not too soon. We don't want to cut too soon. We spoke to Austin Goolsby, uh, the president uh, of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Here's part of the conversation that we had with him. It feels like the economy's been quite strong on the growth front. You got big jobs numbers, you got big GDP numbers better than expected. But at the same time, we've had inflation better than expected too. If we just keep getting more data like what we have gotten, we're well on the, uh, I believe that we should be well be on the path to normalization. So Constance, how much of that is going to be, we're gonna to cut to normalize versus cut because something's really wrong, which then kind of dictates how many we're really gonna see? Yeah, well, ideally they would prefer to cut to normalize. And, 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 and I would even question if they need to go all the way to normal. We don't really, I think, know exactly what that is, right? Because um, the long-term Fed funds is two and a half. Let's say they cut down to four. You still have slightly restrictive policy but if we have a higher productivity economy that can handle um, a higher Fed funds, uh, then uh, that that could possibly be where they where they need to get to. So um, we're going to have to wait and see what the new normal is. Um, but I do think that they they need to start cutting because while the headline of the jobs number was good, while the breadth seemed to be uh, broadening out, which is of course a really good thing, um, we look at those hours work numbers and they were not just in sort of the seasonal or weather dependent sectors like construction and retail, which they were, but they were in a broader number of sectors where you had a decline in hours worked. So I would never want to pin my forecast on one piece of jobs data. January is normally quite noisy. So yeah. I think we're going to need a couple more pieces of jobs data to really determine what's going on there. Um, you mentioned the, the Bloomberg proprietary data on layoffs. We do the same thing at MPP, but we also look at hiring, which is unfortunately at the lowest level since the pandemic began.
All right. Well, a lot of data points that everyone needs to parts. Constance, have to leave it there. Always a wonderful conversation. Constance Hunter, Senior Advisor over at Macro Policy Perspectives, helping us kick things off to the close here on this Monday afternoon. Coming on, we're going to get the outlook from Omar Aguilar, the CEO and CIO at Schwab Asset Management. More on where he is deploying capital at the firm with almost a trillion dollars in assets under management. Plus, can the tech giants really live up to all the AI hype? Yana Eggers, CEO over at Neurologics, uh, joins us with her take. And an $11 billion deal, Novo Nord is sealing it for Catalent. We're going to talk to you a little bit more on the move to help meet surging demand for its weight loss drugs. All that and more coming up in just a bit. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Big tech companies setting a very high bar in 2023, and even yesterday and last week's reporting season also. And a lot of those companies like NVIDIA, Microsoft, Alphabet, they're all driven by demand for artificial intelligence. So we want to get the outlook for more in 2024. Here with us in the studio is Yana Eggers, CEO of Neurologics. Uh, she's a frequent speaker, writer, and mentor on AI and startups. So great person to get perspective on it. Yana, wh what's the dynamic going to be with AI in terms of spending a lot of money for the infrastructure and getting stuff done, and then the demand pickup. Yeah, so I, I think that's the challenge that you're going to see is I think there's going to be some questions on cost, which impacts margin. And so with the big tech companies, there's going to be question on that. There's also a question on open source or not. Mm -hmm. And so the predictions on open source versus proprietary are, are they're about even. A lot of people say, no, it's going to be open source, so you have folks, the big tech companies that are focused on open source, and you have big tech companies that are focused on proprietary. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. So I, what, I'm, what I'm struck by is that we talk about how expectations are already baked in, they're really lofty, they're not going to make it, and then they keep making it, and they keep making money. Um, when is the expectation going to be too high for what's re what the reality is? I think it was um, Gardner in 2019 that said we're reaching the peak of our inflated expectations on AI. <laughs> five <laughs> so, years later. <laughs> and, and here we are, five years later, as you said. So I think there's still so much opportunity and there's so much more, you know, a lot of the predictions are around the multimodal um, for this coming year. And I think we're so close to that. So you're going to see audio and video incorporated in with the, the text now. So Well, that's what I'm curious about. Are the expectations really that high? Because I at least feel like, at least from what we as consumers can see, what we're facing, I don't actually see a lot of AI. I mean, I know it's there. I know they're working on it here. But I feel like the real deployment of that is still kind of out there somewhere. It is. It's yeah. underneath. So yeah. you don't see it. It's impacting your life every day, but yeah. you're not quite seeing it. Right. And um, so I think that's why, you know, the expectations were still going to ex exceed mm -hmm. because they're selling to businesses. They're not selling to you. Right. Uh -huh. And those businesses are going to continue it. to invest. <laughs> yeah. But what, where, where do we stand, though, in terms of the proliferation of the technology? There's been a lot of talk, of course, uh, about the advancements and how fast those advancements can be, how regulators are behind the curve. I know you're familiar with Moore's Law. You're probably familiar with Bayes' theorem and all this. And so everyone's looking at that and saying that, is there an acceleration going on here that maybe for those of us who aren't knee deep in this industry, kind of blind to? So I think what's important here is Amara's yeah. law, yeah. which is we always uh, overestimate what's going to happen in the near term in technology and underestimate what's happened in the long term. Okay. And what you're still going to see is all of these companies making big investments right now, which is the right thing for them. They've got to figure out the technology. So you're going to have the big tech companies still getting money coming in as the corporations figure out how to deploy it. But you're still only at, you know, with most companies, they're only at four to 10% deploying of the projects that they start. Mm -hmm. So you're having a lot of testing that's going on that they're paying for. And then the question's gonna be what happens when that testing stops uh -huh. and they go into production. How are the revenues gonna level out then? How, is there a first mover advantage or is there just enormous pie for everybody? I think there's a first mover advantage. And the reason I say that is you really have to figure out what works for your company. And so that's where a lot of that testing occurs is how do I specialize or you're just going to be generic. And that, that's why I'd say, you know, if you come in second on something like this, you're more going to be generic. 
rather than figuring out what actually works with your culture and how you're going to run it and how even you're going to regulate it within your own company. Hmm. All right, always an uh, interesting conversation, Jenna. And I think every time we talk to you, you leave, and I'm just even more like stressed out about, <laughs> about what's going on. Anyway, uh, Jenna knows, <laughs> knows more about this than anyone, of course, uh, a lifetime uh, in the tech industry, including of her own firms. Now, the CEO uh, over at the AI based neuroscience company, Nara Logics. And Alex, it, it does raise a lot of questions. I mean, last year, I felt like the whole media narrative was either the two extremes either this was going to kill us all or it was going to be our salvation. And now it seems like the nuance is starting to come a little bit more more into focus. Yeah, but don't you feel like anyone just still talks about it and says AI in their conference calls, but I have no idea what that actually means for every company? Yeah. Like, it's not the same thing as six months ago where you said it and your stock went up, but I, I still think, like, we still talk about it in that sense, but it's yeah, hard to like understand Yeah, like when you hear reality. a soup company talking about how AI is But maybe, I don't know. You know, those, all those cans you have under your bed, you realize, okay, Again. you know, maybe I should just listen, at least for right now, to the actual technologist. I mean, it could, it could, yeah. could be true, but yeah. I mean, that, that's where I feel like I get confused. Like, what's actually reality in terms of making the money, and then what actually is just sort of a cool sentence you're going to say on your earnings call. Yeah, well, maybe both. Maybe. All right, coming up here, a focus on drug maker Eli Lilly. Set to put out its fourth quarter report tomorrow, and sales of its weight loss drugs like Zepbound will likely dominate that conversation. Rival Novo Nordis already ramping up its own drug production. We're going to give you a preview of what to expect. Coming up next here on The Close, this is Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Mattel, the maker of Hot Wheels and Barbie dolls, downgraded to neutral. This over at J.P. Morgan. Holiday sales didn't bow well for the toy industry overall, largely because of lower income consumers who pulled back on discretionary spending. And the analyst says that Barbie bump for Mattel was unexpectedly short lived. Those shares taking a leg down by about 2% here on the day. Next up, Goldman Sachs raising its price target on NVIDIA to 800 bucks from 625. And it says generative AI spending by those large cloud service providers is going to drive material upside to NVIDIA's 2024 and 2025 estimates. He says recent data checks also suggest robust AI server demand and improving GPU supply. NVIDIA shares, which don't really need to go any higher, are moving higher, 3% here on the day. And finally, let's take a look at Cigna. The insurance company raised to outperform over at RBC Capital with the analysts seeing a good path for the company's 2024 EPS growth. And that's going to be supported by share buybacks and a more solid operating backdrop. As for those talks about acquiring Humana, the analyst says he expects that to cool off here in the near term. Those shares basically unchanged here on the day. And those are some of our top calls. We do want to stay with the sell side space and stick with healthcare and touch on some big news from drug maker Novo Nordisk, buying three manufacturing plants for about $11 billion. Its parent company also agreeing to buy Catalan for $16.5 billion. Shares of U.S. rival Eli Lilly jumping amid the news of those twin deals. Quarterly results for Eli Lilly, that's set to drop tomorrow morning. Joining us to sort of sift through it all is Lee Brown, global sector lead for healthcare over at Third Bridge. All right, Lee, let's first start off with Eli Lilly. And before we get to some of the individual numbers uh, for the quarter, I am curious if you can sort of put some context around this sort of race to uh, weight loss dominance, if you will. There's been a lot of talk about the first mover advantage that Novo Nordisk had, but we know Eli Lilly is nipping at their heels. Where do they stand in this race right now? Sure. Well, they stand in a very strong position. They're certainly far behind in terms of revenue run rate relative <clears throat> to Novo. I mean, you look at next year, Mongero is expected to do about $6.8 billion, Azimpic $17 billion. Uh, similarly, Zep Pound, $2.4 billion, remember, just got FDA approved this past November. Well, Gobi's expected to do $8.7 billion. So, Novo's still the Goliath, um, but Lily's doing everything they can to catch up. I'm very excited to, uh, to dig into Lily Direct later. Well, let's just, uh, well, let's do that right now here. I mean, talk to us a little bit more about what you expect out of the report tomorrow. More importantly, what you really want to hear from them beyond just the numbers. Well, what I love about Lily Direct is it's really kind of changing the paradigm. We've heard about direct to consumer for uh, uh, you know for two decades now, but what's really interesting about our healthcare system is a lot of times you pay outsized deductibles or coinsurance that doesn't take into account the rebates that pharmacy benefit managers negotiate on behalf of plans. 
Uh, with the uh, Lilly Direct, you can choose not to even use your health care insurance, especially if your plan doesn't cover the weight loss indications like for, for Zepound or Wagovi and get a prescription for Zepound and get an immediate rebate uh, somewhere around the line of 45%. So it's a pretty good deal for those who aren't going to have coverage for this plan year to still access the drug. And I think that's going to do a lot to accelerate uptake for uh, Zepound. Uh, Lee, we were just talking about first mover advantage when it comes to AI. Is there a first mover detriment when it comes to these weight loss drugs, which kind of puts Eli Lilly in an even better spot? Well, I would say no. I mean, I, I'm, I'm tempted to say yes, but one of the things that uh, Novo Nordisk has done extremely well is develops trust and relationships with prescribing doctors. Uh, Lily, of course, has that as well. They're just a little bit late. I will say that there's a bit of a difference in differentiation between the two drugs. I'm talking about um, terzepatide versus uh, semaglutide. That would be Novo's drugs versus... <clears throat> Um, Lily's drugs, I think the general consensus is Manjaro, which is trizepicide, uh, is better than Ozempic. Mm -hmm. So we, I think this is going to be an interesting race. I definitely think um, Lily's going to catch up, but it's going to take a few years. Uh, does Lily have production manufacturing constraints in the same way that Novo Nordisk did, does did, which is kind of why they made this acquisition to begin with? Yeah, it was really interesting to see the news on Catalyst this morning. You guys did a great job talking about the $16.5 billion deal at the parent. They're obviously trying to shore up their uh, fill and finishing capabilities. They've struggled with Catalan, who was their CDMO, their contract development and manufacturing organization. And so uh, Lilly has not run into the same problems other than being supply constrained just because of the accelerated uptake. Um, both companies, I will say, even outside of Catalan, have made prior announcements about significant capital investments to scale manufacturing. Hey, Lee, great stuff. Super appreciate it, Lee Brown. We're all looking forward to those earnings over at Third Bridge. Thank you very much. What I thought was interesting, Romain, is we had the AI craze, right? And then halfway through last year, we had the weight loss drug craze. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yes, it was great. But, like, that's yeah. still continuing, and that's also real. Like, you were seeing money being spent on manufacturing, yeah. and you're seeing a lot of demand pick up. And not only is it real, but really the demand pickup is real a thing. I mean, we talk about an industry that is still, in many of the weight loss, uh, these prescription yeah, yeah. weight loss drugs, still very nascent, right? We talk about the uptake right now, given that so many insurers don't cover it, so you're already dealing with a much smaller pool of people. If that starts to broaden out, I mean, this could really be kind of that blockbuster drug, at least uh, the, the collection of drugs that we've seen, probably not since the 1950s and 60s. My favorite, though, yeah. is when you get like the ancillary thing, like this will be good for Botox, because if you lose yeah. all the weight, you get that weird face thing where your skin hangs, therefore you need Botox. Like those, have you not what? heard this one? No, I missed that one. No, so my, this, yeah. my, my skin will hang? Yeah, your skin's going to hang because you lost so much weight. Intentionally? There, well, because of the drug, oh. and therefore you'll need Botox, and that'll be bullish Botox. Botox to make it all go up again. Oh, interesting. Those things I find quite funny. Wow. I think I saw this plot of, isn't this like the plot of the Lion King or something, <laughs> a whole circle of life? Totally, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mufasa and Botox. <laughs> All right, coming up, the OECD is out with its latest outlook for global growth. We're going to dig deeper into the developing economies with Chaitanya Kandarhi, uh, Deputy CIO of the Solutions and Multi-Asset Group over at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. So how, how do you feel about global growth this year? Like, are you going to travel? Are you buying a lot of stuff? You know, I feel about as confident as, as anyone else. But I guess, you know, we know that this is an economy that is starting to show some bifurcation. You have some people at certain yeah. income spectrums comfortable to spend and other folks aren't. And that's exactly right. The yeah. OECD predicted something very similar to that. Like, mm -hmm. we're going to see growth, but it's like 2.9% versus 3.1%, so lower than last year. But it's still growing. There's still stuff as inflation comes down. Yeah, I mean, there's still stuff out there. But this gets into that whole idea of perception, right? Yes. I mean, you, we can look at the numbers and be all wonky about it. But what about those folks who aren't wonky, Alex Steele? Who are they? I don't know. Soup cans and gold bars. <laughs> anyway, the OECD wrote in their report for this year for their outlook saying that recent indicators point to some moderation of growth while with the effects of tighter financial conditions continuing to appear in credit and housing markets and global trade remaining subdued. Not terrible, just, you know, subdued. Chief economist Claire Lombardelli spoke to Bloomberg about that outlook. 
We're seeing a, a mixed picture around the world. China, um, you know, we predict growth of just under 5%. I mean, obviously, that's, that's uh, relatively high to some, compared to some advanced economy countries, but it's less than some people hoped for for China in terms of its rebound from COVID, and it's less than we've seen from China in the past. Uh, in contrast, we've got a stronger picture in the US. The US data has been looking better, and other urging, um, some of the other emerging markets are also showing some, some strong growth. Joining us now is Jitania Kandari, a deputy CIO of the Solutions of Multi-Asset Group over at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Let's just pick up uh, where that sound left off, which was China. Like, U.S. might be actually okay, but China with a four handle for growth, right? They're still seeing, like, disinflation continuing. What does that do to your outlook for this year? I think what's important to note is that China's contribution to global growth has actually come down because it has become a more domestically driven economy trying to grow more endogenously rather than rely on the external drivers of growth like manufacturing investment of, of the past. Uh, so at one level, uh, a lot of the other countries that are, uh, you know, that used to be dependent on China uh, in the region or even outside are actually are growing on their own and also benefiting from the supply chain diversion that's happening on account of China. So definitely it is the impact of that drag from China is much lower than the past uh, as you look at contribution to global growth and even commodity prices, et cetera, where other drivers are taking over like the green transition, et cetera. But then you get sort of areas, say, like luxury goods, for example, that had a nice boost last year around this time because of China growth. And then we're not seeing the Chinese sort of travel in the same way. So we're losing steam in a lot of luxury products, even if the fundamental underlying um, uh, idea of those stocks makes sense. How do you rationalize that for this year? You know, I think what's really interesting, uh, some of these luxury brands being in Europe, for example, yeah, exactly. uh, will actually benefit from a cheap euro. So a lot of the European companies uh, that have exposure to uh, these kind of brands uh, are benefiting from the euro uh, at one end, but also on the domestic side, Europe has be remained much more uh, cautious in terms of private consumption, consumer confidence has been much lower, savings rate are much higher than, than the US in the last year. And now with inflation coming down, interest rates coming down, some of these uh, markets and companies can actually do well. In fact, uh, a great opportunity is opening up in the European small cap because a lot of their interest rate uh, were floating rates. And that was a big drag. And Europe's an interest rate sensitive economy. And when rates come off, uh, that would be a nice kicker for those earnings. And some of these uh, other uh, luxury stocks, as you say, also will do well. It's interesting. And I, I want to get your kind of thoughts, though, on a much bigger picture thing. I mean, what is this? We're February 2024. So we're basically four years removed from officially the start of the pandemic. And it was a pandemic that really upended everything, at least the way we think about things. Most people expected that to be sort of a structural sea change, whether it's the way we work, the way we shop, or the way we invest. Did that last? Meaning, did those structural changes, were they really structural? You know, it's interesting because we are almost seeing a reversion to familiar patterns. You know, no, no more higher for longer, which was the rhetoric last year. 60-40, which was thrown out in the asset allocation, yeah, is back, yeah. is a reliable starting mm -hmm. point for asset allocation today. Uh, the green transition, a swift response to climate change, uh, has not curbed oil demand. Uh, that's a marathon, not a sprint. It's going to take a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, Populism, interestingly, has peaked, which was one of the big stories on the political side, given that this is a heavy election year with 75 countries, almost 50% of the global population going to vote. Uh, populism has come off in, in Latin America. Uh, 17 out of 18 incumbents have lost mm -hmm. uh, since 2019. Yeah. Uh, so what does that mean, though, for investors? I, I mean, even on the populist thing, I, I find that interesting that we kind of have peaked and even though it doesn't necessarily feel that way on the ground. But if you are an investor, really, or even anyone, you know, uh, an executive sort of trying to uh, think about capital spending here, does that fundamentally change how you view things or how you allocate? You know, I think what's important, even we learned in the last few years, mm -hmm. it's it's not it's not politics, it's policy, right? Even within the populist populace, where who really did the right? 
policy and offer the right prescription for their respective economy. So I think there's a lot of heterogeneity in the way we kind of scan that political landscape uh, and we'll continue to do that. But it's interesting to note that some of these extreme uh, uh, elements on the on the political side are, are getting more moderate and more central. So you had your outlook for this year come out. You mentioned uh, small caps in Europe. You sort of talked about some broad themes. What, what's your, like, your most confident call for this year? Okay, I'll start really big picture. I think 60-40, as I said, is a really good starting point for asset allocation. Uh, I do like, uh, you know, we do like, uh, we do like pockets of uh, U.S. Of course, there's AI, but we think that that frenzy moves into more of the AI-first business models and companies that are going to use AI to enhance their productivity. There may be some winners. Uh, an equal-weighted U.S. Uh, index is is a great opportunity to buy the more diverse diversified opportunities in the U.S. Uh, we like Europe because I, for reasons I mentioned, uh, growth has been subdued. I do like a yen. Uh, the, I'm positive on the yen. So while a lot of the yen beneficiaries, de depreciating yen beneficiaries worked in the last couple of years because yen weakened, I think the reverse will hold where appreciating yen beneficiaries, yeah. which are industrials and consumer discretionary in Japan, uh, look good. And of course, a lot of the emerging markets, ex-China, look very interesting to me, whether it's India, pockets of Latin America, Southeast Asia, or even uh, markets like Poland. All right, Jatanya, great stuff here. And of course, uh, her uh, latest uh, outlook here for the year is out. Jatanya Kandari, Deputy CIO of the Solutions and Multi Asset Group over at Morgan Stanley Investment uh, Management. Uh, interesting, too, their call on the yen. I mean, we hear this a lot, right? Not only a bet on the yen, Alex, but of course, a bet on, I guess, kind of a real change in Japan after, what, three decades of. Uh, anemic growth? Yeah, just how sustainable will wage growth be and how sustainable will inflation be? Clearly, the BOJ is tentative. My thing is, even if they just hike once or twice, is that really going to move the needle when you have the Fed that's going to cut four, five, six times? Yeah, that's a good I point. Know. I don't know. There's some people arguing that maybe you're finally starting to see a divorce in that correlation. I don't know. It'll take months uh, for that to sort itself out. And who told you the Fed was cutting? Didn't, the, you, didn't you hear Jay Powell the market on, on at 60 some point, Minutes? You know, he said, he said, he said, maybe not 12 coming. times in the next couple months, <laughs> but you know. All right, a lot more coming up on the program here, including a look at some of the biggest movers on the day. Estee Lauder rallying. Uh, this after the cosmetics giant has apparently reached an inflection point as a result of its cu uh, cutting its workforce. It's our stock of the hour. It's coming up next here on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, only about 108 stocks in the S&P 500 or higher on the day, and Estee Lauder is one of them. It is our stock of the hour with the shares rallying 13% after the beauty brand uh, actually said that it's cutting as many as 3,000 roles worldwide from the company as part of a restructuring plan. Abigail Doolittle joining us now with a little bit more here. Uh, on the big move higher, uh, this is one of the biggest gains we've seen on the stock in quite some time. This is all about them cutting jobs? I think it's a relief yeah. rally. I mean, this stock has really had a hard time over the last couple of years, down more than 50%. So this is an acknowledgement that they have a problem that they're going to do something. So they put up basically an OK uh, quarter, but then this surprise restructuring. One analyst saying that we have the turnaround stock. There's actually now a turnaround plan. So they this is a giant company. I didn't actually realize they have a ton of brands. Yeah. Uh, the Ordinary, Clinique, Tom Ford. It goes on and on and on. In addition to the flagship Estee Lauder, so 68 a uh, thousand people. This cut equals could equal about three thousand people or so. Uh, the goal is to make the company leaner, more profitable, and then also I don't know if you guys have seen this, but on like I don't use TikTok, but apparently on TikTok yeah. uh, there's these beauty trends that come out, and then everybody's rushing to Sephora yeah. to get the new brand. So SA Lauder is not one of them. So they want to be able to try to harness that kind of energy. Wait, they're not on TikTok. Well, I don't well, know. I've not, not seen cool Estee Lauder mentioned. Like, not Thrive cool Cosmetics, thing. like its whole career right. has been from like TikTok and then you Well, I was going to say. Yeah, I, and like I, Elf I Cosmetics, yeah. like all these new brands. Like you go to Sephora, I mean, every time I go there, I get sucked into some new little brand like watermelon juice or this, that, and the other. And so, <laughs> You're totally speaking remains like Watermelon language. juice. I know. <laughs> but the point is, what I, I thought was really interesting <laughs> is like invest in your face is something that yes. we talk about a lot. 
And usually people invest in their face and they're like price agnostic, right? But they're willing to pay anything for it. Now, some of their high-end brands have been doing really well. So I wonder if it's the lower end then that's really about the competition. Well, it's interesting. So the competition, it's actually might go the other. It's a little bit of both. So mm -hmm. L'Oreal's uh, eating their cake right now. So they have the sort of lower end uh, CeraVe and La Roche brands, which I'm not so familiar La Roche, with. it's a French brand. It's, yeah, so and that's owned by L'Oreal. So they've been taking market share, apparently. Uh, and then the upcomers like that we were just talking about taking uh, some share. But they, part of this turnaround plan is actually to boost the high-end brands to use more uh, ingredient-led beauty products. Apparently, they're doubling down on that. That's another big piece of that plan. So let's see whether or not that does that. I mean, do you guys use Estee Lauder? No. I use a Biologique Recherche. That's what I use. But this is <laughs> way about Romaine's like, I'm out of this conversation in entirely. No. Really? No, I just let God decide. Okay, well, we're, we're, we're going to get on that. We're going to get you some nice face cream, do a little moisturizer, maybe a some mask. Some spritzers. Yeah. It's going to be good. Is it? Okay. He has nothing else to say. Oh, is that we're right. all going a little spa trip? Is that <laughs> the spa idea? trip. Um, but I think that the <laughs> yes, idea is that, like, we'd that, love to do a spa trip. That, like, that's what people will invest in. Yeah. Like, yes. I never buy full price, and I'm a great counter indicator, right? So I never buy full price except when it comes to skincare. Well, so it never goes on sale and they have pricing power. Yeah, like SkinCeuticals, that's a brand I'll pay for. But apparently their fragrance is actually doing better than their skincare. So that's really? a point that people are going more toward other skincare brands. And I think a lot of them, like you go against the four Ulta, they have all of these fresh brands, they're vegan, the watermelon, the cucumber. You know, Estee Lauder, I don't think has a lot of that right now. So maybe they just have to refresh. And another point is they have so many products. It's such a big company that some analysts are saying, I know it's hard to take this seriously. No, um, but it's hard, to do it. it's hard to maintain yeah. the innovation and keep it hot at the same time. All right, Abigail, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Watermelon and cucumber. That I don't know. Okay, Abigail Doodle joining us there. Coming up, an outlook from Omar Aguilari, CEO and CIO over at Schwab Asset Management, where Omar he's deploying capital at the firm with almost a trillion dollars in assets under management. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. Just about 10 minutes, Alex, until we get to the closing bells. A modest uh, sell-off here in the stock market, but a more severe sell-off right now in the Treasury market. Much better than you would have thought yeah. at like 10.03 when the ISM services crossed. But I, I love some of the decliners here. They're really interesting. Air Products, the biggest decliner within the S&P, off a whopping 15%. It's a chemical company. It sells a lot of stuff to China. Their read-through was really not great. I wonder about the global read there. Uh, also taking a look here, at uh, on semi you had a semiconductor industry association looking at good sales so the whole sort of socks index uh not doing as terribly and and caterpillar i just love me some caterpillar they may not be a big mover yeah. but talk about energy transportation it looks really good for the fourth quarter they sort of fluffed away any sort of global yeah, economic the, slowdown issues i like it well it is a nice barometer though and when you sort of got that read through not only on what's happening here in mm -hmm. north america but obviously everyone really focused on china uh and whatever rebound i guess investors are looking for there yeah. here maybe caterpillar gave a glimmer of hope. Yeah, uh, for, and very different that. compared to air products. Ab absolutely. All right, our next guest, though, says he's redeploying capital in undervalued areas of equities like small caps, value stocks, real estate, and healthcare. Omar Aguilar joining us, Chief Executive Officer and CIO over at Schwab Asset Management. Schwab Asset Management has over $959 billion in assets under management. Omar, great to see you here. Uh, we're kind of still at the start of the new year, and every time we start to talk about uh, that sort of redeployment of cash, all that cash that was on the sidelines here, the big question is always, when does that happen, and more importantly, where does it go? It looks like you have a few ideas to that. Yes, thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, an interesting start of the year, I think, uh, obviously coming from a October rally on the uh, equity market and going in through this year with the strong momentum. And, you know, you see the positive things going through the economy. You know, we see manufacturing doing well. We see productivity doing well. We see the uh, labor market being very solid. And overall, that puts obviously a lot of really strong, you know, um, positive, you know, put into the uh, economy and to the equity market. And therefore, you know, the opportunity for looking at the overall asset allocation for the rest of the year in, in anticipation of what, you know, everybody thinks about the Federal Reserve and other central banks might do with respect to monetary policy, you know, thinking about how we can support our clients mm -hmm. as they think about areas where they can deploy their cash. Are you and usually what we try to work with our clients on redeploying that cash is areas where they may have, um, 
you know, underexposure, areas that have not done as well as other parts of the market and areas that will probably benefit as we go into the next phase of the economic cycle. You- so when we think about areas that didn't do as well last year, Areas in the cyclical sectors, areas in the small cap, you know, tend to do very well when the market and when the economy starts to go into the next phase of the recovery. And then at the same time, you know, we actually see that opportunity for the relative valuation opportunities. Do you worry at all about maybe some of the volatility in the market as people sort of try to make these bets about uh, where the economy is going and the pace of monetary policy? You know, we'd be remiss in not pointing out that, I don't know, just a few weeks ago, we started a huge drop in Treasury yields, as everyone anticipated, a multitude of Fed rate cuts. And now, at least over the last few days, we've seen this huge spike up in yields, as now everyone has to walk that back. And I have a feeling we're going to see a rinse and repeat of this, at least over the next few weeks and months, until we get more clarity out of the Fed. Yeah, volatility and definitely volatility in the fixed income market will be here a little bit longer as, you know, the the Fed is trying to navigate. And actually not just the Fed, it's in general, all central banks are trying to just balance, you know, the activity that is happening in the economy with the level of interest rates and the timing for for cutting or making their face cut. I think what is important for clients or for investors to think is that, you know, um, just in November of last year, we're still in the process of thinking about potential rates hikes. Now the discussion that we are having is when and how many rate cuts we're going to have in 2024. That is a positive, you know, a spin that we can actually see related to what we might have going forward. You're completely right that we're going to see interim, you know, bond yield volatility as the market expectations change as the timing of when the Fed will do the first move. But overall, you know, the the, the timing of that will be a lot of that related to where the labor market is. It's kind Mm -hmm. of an interesting situation right Right now, where you see very strong labor market, where you see very solid economic, you know, data, and yet we see that the inflation is going down the way that the Fed wants it to see. So that is kind of an unlikely scenario, but therefore something that at some point is going to have to balance it out, you know, either by yeah. the inflation, you know, not necessarily being as good, or by the economy continuing its momentum. So, Omar, in in that case, both things can be true, right? Stocks can go higher and also yields can be higher, uh, even though they're responding to the same kind of thing. What I'm interested, though, is where they intersect. And that, to me, is sort of the T-bill market. Bank of America had a really interesting note that said 80 percent, sorry, 80 of the S&P 500 companies now offer higher dividends than three uh, over the next three years than cash. That money is going to go somewhere then. Does it belong to the stock market? Well, you know, I think the, the the biggest opportunity here is obviously not necessarily just going in through the equity market because yields in the fixed income market, as, as you pointed out, is still very attractive and still compete with, you know, some of the equity dividends. The bigger question will be, as you know, you see those equity dividend payers in equities, you know, being sustainable and stay at that level. Is that going to be an area that is going to be at the same, you know, um, I would say level of risk? that you will have when you invest in bonds. And I think that's the key component that you have. It is great to diversify your sources of income. It is important to get income from equities through dividends. But at the same time, you need to understand the risk associated with what you get by having the price appreciation and the price right. movement on equities that what you have in terms of volatility of the income that you get on bonds. So, so I Omar, think it's just the balancing of the two. So that kind of brings me then to small caps, which will be very levered to the volatility uh, in the bond market as well, though, if the economy is holding up. How much cyclical risk, say, in small caps should you be taking on? Well, I think, you know, when you when you look at the level of, you know, the the valuations that you see in the small cap area, as well as the sensitivity that you have to interest rates, you know, there is no no other question other than when is going to be the opportunity for small caps to actually take the lead. We haven't seen that yet because a lot of the performance in equities and a lot of the multiple expansion that we have seen in the S&P 500 has come very concentrated in the top, you know, 10 stocks in the S&P 500. And therefore, the opportunity for those mid cap and small caps is still, you know, very, very much in there. Now, again, the sensitivity to interest rates for that set of companies, as well as for the consumers, has been less than what we have seen historically. And a lot of that is because of the level of cash and the level of cash that a lot of corporations still have. 
All right, Omar, going to have to leave it there. Always great to talk to you. Omar Aguilar, CEO and CIO at Schwab Asset Management, counting us down to those closing bells. We are just about two and a half minutes away from that, Alex, and coming off four straight weeks of gains, a bit of a pause, at least in the equity market right now. It could have been a lot worse, though. You got yeah. the ISM services, huge spike in yields. You're yeah. looking at the S&P dropping like a stone. We did not come, and we came nicely back from that. And it was interesting, too, coming out of last week where we had so many mm -hmm. catalysts, and we started a new week. Potentially some big catalysts ahead as well. Stick with us. We're going to break down all the market coverage and take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. And here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Scarlett Fu, Carol Masser, and Tim Stenovic. Happy Monday to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, television, radio, originals, and our partnership with YouTube here. On a day where everybody right now, uh, Carol Masser, looking yeah. at what we heard out of Jay Powell, looking at what we saw in that ISM data, and of course looking at all the latest announcements out of companies about laying off workers. Yeah, absolutely. Trying to make sense of it, right? Strong services, so important to the U.S. economy, right? And then you have to kind of cross that with continued headlines when it comes to layoffs. Um, I feel like there's a lot of cross currents, but ultimately you can't ignore what's going on in terms of the U.S. Treasury curve to see those rates kind of moved off, move up, if you will, again, all along the curve, guys. And to that end, I thought in the equity trade today that we'd be talking more about a sell-off at, at this point. Um, we were down as much as eight-tenths of a percent on the S&P 500 a little earlier, and it seemed like the tone was really negative uh, as people were digesting what Powell said last night, even though I don't actually think it was any different than what he said on Wednesday, but that's a debate for another time. Um, but we've seen some uh, buying and uh, buying into the close a little bit off our worst levels of the day. Off our worst levels of the day, but it's interesting that because chip makers, especially NVIDIA, are doing well, mm -hmm. the index losses are pretty minimal, but then when you look at the breadth in the market, it's fairly negative. My question is good news, bad news now. Are we back to that, Romain? Are we back to, hey, ISM service is great news, so therefore we're going to trade a little heavy on the equity index? I think we're still kind of in good is good and bad is bad, at least until, I guess, uh, Jay Powell tells us differently. ISM was really such a mixed bag, though, because you could have looked at that report and seen that soft landing scenario. You can also mm -hmm. look at that report and say, you know, the fight against inflation is far from over. Uh, the knee-jerk reaction, of course, in the markets today was to the downside, whether it was on the back of Powell's comments or on that ISM data. Dow Jones Industrial Average lower by about seven-tenths of a per percent, about 276 points lower. The S&P lower by about 16 points or three-tenths of a percent, while the NASDAQ Composite is going to finish out the day lower by 31 points or about two-tenths of, of a percent. But your big laggard here, once again, Remains the Russell 2000, some of those cyclical names. The Russell as a whole down about 25 points on the day, or 1.3 percent. All right, I'm going to jump on what Scarlett said, mm -hmm. uh, the semiconductor area, the SOX in particular, really some outperformance there, uh, up about 1.2 percent. You've got two-thirds of the names, uh, Scarlett, in the index higher. I'm going to get into some of the specific movers, two of them in particular, that have really provided some support to the overall trade today in just a moment. Yeah, in the meantime, let's take a look at the big picture within equities, and that is your different sectors. Eleven sectors, you could see over overwhelmingly red uh, materials, utilities and REITs leading the way down. In fact, utilities and materials each losing at least 2%. Uh, the bright spots were Infotech and there's that semiconductor uh, over outperformance there with that group uh, rising two thirds of 1% as a whole and healthcare uh, finishing in the green by three tenths of 1%. All right, folks, I'll get to the semi uh, individual names that really rose today in just a moment, but got to talk SD Lauder uh, up 19% at its highs, finishing the day with about a 12% gain, number one gainer in the S&P 500 surging the most in more than a decade, cutting as much as 3,000 positions. We talk about, we continue to see job cuts. Uh, this is part of a restructuring plan to put one of the world's largest beauty companies back on track. Many investors, as we know, would have said um, this was long and coming and needed. So nonetheless, this was certainly a now performer. Catalent, um, kind of love this name and the story. This was your number two gainer in the S&P 500. Novo Nordics, uh, its biggest shareholder, is buying Catalent. It's one of the world's biggest uh, drug manufacturers manufacturing company. $16.5 billion is the price tag. Novo basically looking for ways to meet the surging demand for those uh, new class of weight loss drugs. They specifically have Wegovy and Ozempic. But I just think, again, this sector continues to excite uh, investors. All right, to the semiconductors we go. On semiconductor, this was top among the S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100. Chipmaker reported fourth quarter results, beat expectations, also gave an outlook that Truist said was better than feared. Uh, fourth quarter revenue also met expectations. And then 
NVIDIA. Sorry, I kind of buried the lead a little bit. Um, at a record again. You do that uh, a lot sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I like to keep everybody waiting. Yeah. Uh, closing at a record for the third straight session. Top of the NASDAQ 100 among the gainers. Goldman Sachs raised its price target on the name to 800 from 625. Uh, you can see the stock closing at what? six? I need my glasses. 699 and change. Um, uh, buy rating stock is on Goldman's conviction list, um, but they go into some of the details and some of the concerns that maybe they were about a drop off in data center revenue. Maybe not there anymore, but nonetheless, NVIDIA. This, yeah. was, this was a good eye test uh, for you. Okay. you know, I because it was, actually, it was actually 693, so but you were close. I, I Who was going to say it? Who was going to say it? I wasn't going to say I it. I spent mean, two that. hours at my eye doctor today doing all these tests. Are your um, eyes still dilated? That could be the issue. That's what I would blame and it on. Change. I and couldn't Goldman see it anyway. 800. Don't worry. Heart love, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, um, <laughs> all right, I'm going to go with uh, some of the decliners today. I, got, I want to start with Tesla, among the worst performers on a points basis in the S&P 500. Shares falling 3.67%. They were down as much as 6.9%. This is all because, well, partly because, I should say, of a report uh, in the German language business publication, Handelsblatt, that said that the IT giant SAP is removing Tesla from its list of car suppliers. Uh, it's because of, according to the newspaper, uh, priceless fluctuations make planning more difficult and pose higher risks. We should note that SAP currently has a total of 29,000 cars in its fleet, though we don't know how many of those are Teslas. And I say this decline is partly because of that, because also over the weekend in the Wall Street Journal, um, they reported that uh, Elon Musk's use of illegal drugs was common knowledge among several current and former Tesla and SpaceX directors. I want to get to the worst performer on a percentage basis in the S&P 500, air products and chemicals, the maker of uh, bottled oxygen, nitrogen, argo, helium, and more, plunged as much as 16%, ended up closing down 15.6%, the most intraday since March 2020. It cut its outlook for the year's adjusted earnings per, sh per share, did get a downgrade from Wells Fargo uh, as a result. And then McDonald's shares uh, falling 3.7%, the biggest drop for shares of McDonald's since May of 2022. Uh, this after the company reported weaker than expected fourth quarter comp sales, due partly to the conflict in the Middle East. Uh, we should say comp sales rose 3.4%, according to McDonald's, that's the slowest since the fourth quarter of 2020, below the average estimate of analysts pulled by Bloomberg. Revenue also came in shy of estimates, Alex. Yeah, this is the expectation game uh, yeah. really there. Mm -hmm. So you have a good global read from both of those kind of companies. All right, let's take a look at the bond market here because, again, you look at these yields and you would have thought we would have held on to that 8 tenth a 1% decline gain for the S&P, and we did not. That just doesn't show the whole story. For the two-year Romain, over the last two days, the yields have backed up on the two-year by 27 basis points at yeah. one time. We haven't seen that since March of 2023, which was around the SVB uh, crisis. So it just goes to show that there's still a lot of oomph there, uh, higher yields. But yet again, stocks somewhat immune, to be honest. Yeah, at least for right now, those moves, uh, at least over the last two days, we'll see if that snaps back as we get deeper into the week, particularly with a slew of Fed speak up ahead. Before we move on here in the program, we do have some breaking news. Uh, this uh, earnings results coming out of Palantir uh, right now. The company in its most recent quarter saying that adjusted EPS and it's always adjusted, coming in at $0.08 cents a share. The street was looking for $0.7.6 cents a share. That's on the back of revenue of about $608 million. Uh, that's a slight beat over street estimates of 603. Here's your forecast. 1Q revenue, 612 to 616. That is the forecast. The street was looking for 617. And as far as adjusted EBITDA for uh, the first quarter, uh, you are looking uh, actually, I don't have that number. I, my apologies there. Uh, the revenue forecast for the first quarter is all we have right now. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in with more on Palantir because it's really on uh, the AI demand that this company is delivering. And in fact, Alex Karp, the CEO of Palantir, is talking about how he is now 85 percent focused on U.S. operations and mm. is rebuilding the whole company to meet the growing AI demand. Um, very much product-driven uh, AI delivering for this company, which is really a software and analysis company. They do a lot of work for governments, uh, military stuff that's kind of top secret, but AI is coming through in a big way right now. You know what's interesting? Our own Lizette Chapman has a write-up mm -hmm. uh, on these results already out, and she interviewed Alex Karp, the CEO of Palantir, who actually told her that they don't know what to do with the onslaught of demand. Here's what he said, quote, our commercial business is exploding in a way we don't know how to handle. We don't know what to do with the onslaught of demand. Yeah, 85% wow. focused on U.S. operations, rebuilding the whole company to meet growing AI demand. It's bombastic, especially since you factor in that we've never succeeded in building an effective sales force. Um, so he says he expects the company to hold about 2,000 training sessions. I mean, this stock was 
on fire last year, up almost 170 uh, percent, and we're definitely seeing that move up in the aftermarket as well. This always just gives me pause for a second that meet explosive demand, but then you wind up ramping up capacity, and then at some point, do you oversupply? There mm -hmm. is a structural shift, but you still have cyclical you know, mini cycles and sort of just take that in stride also. Yeah. And I mean, Alex is, uh, Alex Carp, I should say, all, has always been a little bombastic, if you will. But I it's interesting, too, because you get to this idea <laughs> of the pivot that they've been trying to make away from just being reliant on uh, the U.S. government and some of the other uh, government agencies overseas to more corporate clients. And this AI, um, at least the way they're framing it, does appear to be that pivot. Yeah, pretty interesting. Well, nonetheless, investors are liking it, guys, in the aftermarket. Quick check here uh, for everybody and the stock da -da -da -da, up almost 10 percent here. So the enthusiasm and plays out. All right, that's a wrap. Phew, Monday almost over. I don't know about you, but I'm already thinking about it's not Friday over yet. It's because uh, of the eye test. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. I'm still blurry. All right, that's a wrap. Across platform, radio, TV, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals. Have a good evening, everybody. We'll see you again. Same time, same place tomorrow. And our coverage continues here on Bloomberg Television. Up next, we're going to take a closer look at what will be the next global box office hit. Richard Galfond, he's the CEO of IMAX. He's going to be joining the big program in just a second, right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. Let's get you a recap of how markets closed on the day. We had stocks falling at the open, hitting their lows in the first hour of trade before we got a steady pairing of losses through most of this session. The S&P 500 finishing down three-tenths of one percent. We know the U.S. economy continues to perform better than everyone expects. Last week, it was the jobs report. Uh, today, it was the service sector. Still, the Fed says it needs to see more good inflation news before cutting rates. Uh, so that good news is bad news for the bond market. Again, you see the two-year yield moving up. Uh, to 4.47%, the 10-year yield moving up 14 basis points to 4.16%, and the dollar strengthens to its highest in almost three months. Let's show you the big equity movers on the day now. We're going to start with Air Products, the worst performer in the S&P 500 after posting an unexpected uh, drop in quarterly sales and cutting its outlook. Snapchat, or Snap, I should say, that's a parent company, down as much as 4.4%. It is yet another tech company cutting jobs. Snap is reducing its workforce by 10% as it tries to offset a slowdown in ad revenue. And among the gainers, Estee Lauder also cutting jobs, but this cosmetics company also announced a restructuring plan that involves selling more profitable, high-end products while discontinuing items that haven't been selling well. Uh, S.A. Lauder was the best performer in the S&P 500. Meantime, you have Catalan uh, now up almost 10% on the day. The parent company of Novo Nordisk buying Catalan for $16.5 billion, including debt. Novo gets three factories so it can speed up production for its various weight loss drugs or drugs that people use for weight loss. Let's go back to the macro view for a moment here because we talked about the Fed. Jay Powell has been sounding the same message, which is the central bank is unlikely to cut rates in March. He introduced this idea to Wall Street last week, and then he reiterated it to the American public in an interview yesterday with 60 Minutes. And the market maybe finally appears to be listening. Fed fund futures are now pricing in 4.6 cuts this year. That is the fewest since December. It's a big, big reduction from the 6.7 cuts expected in mid-January. Of course, it's nowhere near what the Fed has said, which is three rate cuts. Powell's argument is that officials want to see more economic data confirming inflation is headed to 2% before it begins its rate cuts. All right, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby among those saying that he would like to see more of the favorable inflation data published in the past several months, but he did not explicitly rule out a move in March. Here's what he told Bloomberg Markets exclusively. It feels like the economy's been quite strong on the growth front. You got big jobs numbers, you got big GDP numbers better than expected. But at the same time, we've had inflation better than expected, too. If you look over the last seven months, we've had seven months of really quite good inflation reports right around or even below the Fed's target. So if we just keep getting more data like what we have gotten, we're well on the uh, I believe that we should be well be on the path to normalization. Well, I understand you don't want to tie yourself down, but is there really much of a chance of a March move? The markets think now 18 percent, and some people think that's even high. Well, look, Michael, as I say, 
all, all we need to do is keep getting information like what we've been getting for the last seven months, where inflation on a flow basis is absolutely under control and is, is in the range of, of our Fed target. Uh, and if we keep getting strong quantity numbers, that is to say jobs numbers, GDP numbers, growth numbers, while inflation goes down, in the conventional view, that's not really supposed to happen. So that would, we'd have to be entertaining the possibility that we're entering a period like the mid to late 90s where you had productivity growth faster than, than expected, faster than trend, and, th and that opens up some new possibilities. Scott Pelley of CBS last night said that Powell suggested that rate cuts would likely be a quarter, maybe a half of a percentage point at a time. That doesn't appear in the transcript. Was a half percentage point cut discussed at the meeting? Um, as you know, we don't report on what's discussed at the meeting until the transcript comes out. The, the, our standard way to think of it from the FOMC is somewhat like what's in the summary of, of economic projections, the SEP, which comes out every quarter. And the last time that came out in December, you saw that the median member of the FOMC thought there would be three rate cuts, i.e. 75 basis points for the year 2024. Is there a situation other than perhaps a recession or some sort of market failure where you would consider a 50 basis point cut? Well, look, I, I just think we, you get the data and, and you respond to the data uh, uh, in its totality. So uh, it's, I, I don't think it makes sense to speculate about hypotheticals of what would happen to make the rate cuts be different than what they have been in the past. That was Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsbee speaking with our Michael McKee. Now, that is the view from policymakers. So where does that leave credit investors? Our next guest says the stars are aligned for investment-grade credit. Maureen O'Connor, global head of high-grade debt syndicate at Wells Fargo, is here with us now. Maureen, great to see you. Great to see you, too. Thanks for having me. So I want to talk about the different ways in which the stars are aligned. But first, I want to piggyback off of what um, Austin and Michael McKee were talking about. Do you see j Powell's message of hire for longer and no-go in March helping or hurting investment-grade credit performance in the medium term? Well, I think what it does is it just actually creates a more advantageous entry point, right? I mean, I think what was kind of pivotal, pivotal about the meeting last week um, with the reworking of the statement and the way that it was done is that it's laid the groundwork for easing with pumping the brakes on the timing, right? So we've confirmed we're at peak terminal rates. Uh, we have elevated yield environment. We've got very tight trading spreads and fundamentals that are supporting that environment. Um, but when you look at investment grade historically as an asset class, a 5% plus yield environment, which is what we've been trading in all year, is usually a trade that makes money. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's historically a very strong entry point. So I think it's just given investors a little bit of a wider window to layer in. And that's exactly what we're seeing right now. We've had really strong demand technicals in our market. And that's been driving these ultra tight valuations and spreads. But again, elevated yields continuing to support that dynamic in our market. So let's talk a little bit about the stars at the alignment. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of new supply in January, which, as I understand, is fairly normal for this time of the year. Right. But you say January 20 2024 was exceptionally busy. What drove the increased issuance? Yeah, so it was a couple things. So yes, January seasonally one of our busiest months of the year, but this was a record January by a pretty good margin, actually. Um, and a couple things were driving that. Number one, spreads are trading at two-year tights. So when you think about who issues bonds into our market, there's typically two types of borrowers. There's coupon-focused borrowers, more of our corporate um, issuers, and then there's more spread-focused borrowers, like the banks. Mm -hmm. And what you saw in January was a lot of bank supply. So they're rushing into the market at a time when spreads are trading at cyclical tights. Um, and it makes sense, right, to take advantage of these really strong demand dynamics and maybe front load some of your issuance plans for 2024, especially considering all the catalysts for volatility in the horizon over the course of this year. Um, but you also have an environment where, you know, we remember where we were in October of last year, yeah. um, where yields were 100 basis points higher than we are now. So even our coupon based issuers are recognizing an opportunity here to de-risk some of their funding plans and get in before things maybe start to change, uh, especially on the spread front where there's clearly going to be more downside to upside potential. And that's a good point you bring up, this window of opportunity for so many issuers. Um, is there a sense that there's a rush before the second half in case the economy does weaken more than people or the Fed expects at this point and election volatility becomes a thing? 
I mean, absolutely. Every election year, you have this anxiety around what's going to happen in the second half of the year. And so I think you typically do see a lot more front loading in those years around that particular dynamic. Um, but I think, yes, absolutely. It feels better to issue into a tighter spread environment than it does a wider spread environment, even if the latter comes with lower Treasury yields. Mm. Um, so I think ultimately what's going to happen this year is you are going to see a very busy first half, a very busy first quarter. So we come, we're coming off of a record January. We're probably heading into a record February for issuance as well. So I think there is a lot of anxiety around what the second half of the year brings. And when it comes to February, you also say that there's going to be some M&A-driven deals. What type or what kind of uh, M&A-driven deals do you see coming to fruition? So we've had a very healthy announced M&A pipeline where um, the debt financing hasn't necessarily priced yet. And so there's a lot of that stuff lining up to go. Why is it lining up in February? Well, these folks have been in blackout around their, their full year results. Um, and so now we're getting through earnings season, 10Ks get filed, that window opens up for these types of issuers. And I think because the market dynamics are so exceptionally strong, there is an incentive to move quicker, um, sooner rather than later, before you let things kind of shift under your feet. So we are expecting a very busy M&A pipeline in February, um, probably something close to $150 billion in total supply. And I would guess about 25% of that comes from strategic volume. Wow. Okay. That's pretty um, something to watch for in the month of February and certainly in the first half of the year. Maureen, really appreciate your joining us yeah. today. Maureen O'Connor of Wells Fargo there. All right, coming up on the close, we've got the top three where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's time now for the top three, where we take a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. And first up is King Charles III. Buckingham Palace has confirmed the monarch is undergoing treatment for cancer, during which time he will suspend public duties. Now, the king was recently treated for a benign prostate enlargement, and it was during that time that the condition was found. The palace did not specify the type of cancer found except to rule out prostate cancer. Next up is Lionel Messi, the soccer star, facing backlash in Hong Kong after he sat on the bench for the entirety of what was supposed to be his first playing appearance in the city. Spectators booed him and his teammates and shouted down David Beckham, the co-owner of the Inter-Miami Soccer Club, when Bex tried to give a speech. In a press conference later on, the Inter-Miami coach said Messi did not play to prevent the risk of further injury. And finally, Kenneth Frazier, the former Merck CEO, and Joseph Bay, the current co-CEO of KKR, were named to Harvard's top governing board. The two corporate leaders will be joining Harvard Corporation at a time of intense scrutiny for the institution from alumni, lawmakers, faculty, and students. And Harvard under pressure is a persistent story. Let's talk about one of its latest challenges, along with another development in higher education, with Bloomberg News reporter Janet Lauren. Jan Janet, to be clear, these new appointments that I just mentioned of Frazier and Bay, they're not in any direct response to the forced resignation of Claudine Gay, are they? No, they had seats to fill, and they were being filled. And they, in Harvard, wisely chose two very uh, seasoned CEOs uh, running public companies that know a lot about governance. And that's a, an issue that they've been under scrutiny for is their governance. Did anyone respond? Did any of the critics, such as like, uh, you know, Bill Ackman, say anything about these two appointments? You know, I, I haven't checked his Twitter page today, <laughs> but I, I suspect we probably would have heard it if there was an issue. Fair enough. Harvard under pressure in its home state of Massachusetts, and you've been writing about this. Um, the state is targeting its massive $51 billion endowment, as well as its legacy policy. What exactly are legislators proposing here? So uh, Harvard's endowment has always been a huge um, you know, place where people are looking for money. It's up to $51 billion. Um, it's already taxed by the federal government, along with uh, more than three dozen other universities. And Massachusetts um, is also looking for a piece of that. Um, there's two bills that are going to be uh, considered this week, whether or not they move forward. One is a 2.5% excise tax on mm -hmm. the total value. So that would raise almost a billion dollars a year from Harvard, and that would go towards funding public education, making uh, almost 30 uh, college and university systems free. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, it could also go for things like pre-K. Um, and that affects, I think it was 10 or 11 schools, including MIT, Williams. You know, there's a lot of rich colleges in Massachusetts, right, Brandeis, right. Tufts, et cetera, as well as Williams and Amherst. 
And the other tax would um, impose uh, a, a tax on schools that have legacy admissions. Like Harvard. Like Harvard, but not MIT, because MIT uh, does not have legacy. They, have, they haven't had it for a while. How would they do this tax? Um, so the tax would be uh, assessed on a, a sliding scale. Okay. And money would fund community colleges. So essentially, it really is sort of a Robin Hood tax the rich and redistribute it to the poor. And finally, you also wrote a story about Dartmouth reinstating the use of standardized tests in admissions, so it'd be joining MIT. Yes. Uh, so MIT is a kind of special place. You really have to do the math. You know, the requirements are, you know, not only math, but two semesters of physics, two semesters of chemistry. You would not want to go there if you couldn't really perform. Right. And Dartmouth announced today that they would require the test for uh, students in high school who are current juniors. And this idea, of course, is to increase diversity because they find that they can get more diverse candidates this way, even with um, adding the standardized test back in. Janet, really appreciate your joining us today. And of course, to check out Janet's uh, reporting, go to Bloomberg.com. Coming up, we take a closer look at the entertainment industry with the CEO of IMAX. But first, which movie production company was co-founded by Charlie Chaplin this day in 1919? The answer to that question next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Which movie production company was co-founded by Charlie Chaplin this day in 1919? The answer, United Artists. On February 5th, 1919, four of Hollywood's biggest stars decided to come together to form a production company aimed at giving them better control of their own work. The stars, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and D.W. Griffith, each held 25% of a venture that they named United Artists. Now, the company found early success with its first film, His Majesty the American, produced and starring Fairbanks, and it continued to produce films through a series of restructures. Eventually, it was sold to MGM in 1981. Now, while United Artists still does exist in name only today, its legacy lives on through classics such as High Noon and the Rocky franchise. Now, speaking of legacy media, as pressures in linear TV mount and whispers about m and grow louder, the Walt Disney Company is in the hot seat when it reports quarterly earnings this week on Wednesday, setting the tone for the media sector. Let's go now to Bloomberg's Thomas Buckley in L.A. to give us a preview. And Thomas, let's start with problem areas. We're talking about streaming and studio. We know that Disney raised prices on its streaming services. Will that lead to subscriber losses and change the timeline of reaching profitability by the fourth quarter of this year? That's a fascinating question, actually, and one that um, is really um, very present on Wall Street's mind. I think that, you know, you'll remember that way back when so much of the focus on streaming was subscriber number growth, and now, obviously, it's all about profitability. Now, I think that a number of analysts are expecting Disney to report operating income in its entertainment division that's maybe going to double year on year, so just south of $700 million. And that's going to be through an aggregation of Bob Iger's cost cuts as he seeks to reach profitability for Disney+, Plus, the flagship streaming service, as well as a bit of um, a tailwind from the latent strikes last quarter. Okay, so something we'll watch for, certainly. Let's talk about the studios, because it has not produced a certifiable hit. Uh, the Marvels and The Wish didn't exactly um, break any records. And things don't necessarily look like they'll get better given the lingering effects of the twin Hollywood strikes. What can you tell us about that business? Yeah, I think that's a fascinating question, actually, over the studio business. You know, it's been run a long time now by Alan Bergman, who had tremendous success earlier um, in his tenure. In recent years, perhaps not so much. I think that, you know, Marvel has come under tremendous pressure, certainly. Um, there's a possibility that that will see a kickback up um, later on this year. But also, I think that, you know, a Pixar franchise um, that's owned by Disney is one that's um, stood the test of time up until the, the most recent release, Elemental. So it's entirely possible that we'll see Inside Out 2 coming out in June, um, outperforming expectations then, on the basis of the first one netted just about $800 million worldwide. What about M&A? Because for a while, uh, Bob Iger was talking about selling the networks, um, and then it seems to be off the table. I mean, this is kind of going to set the tone for whatever uh, consolidation we do see in the industry. That's right. Um, I think that, you know, early on in his uh, second tenure, Bob flagged that, you know, 
possibly he wouldn't be acquiring all of Hulu as though he, you know, despite his being contractually obligated to do so. Um, there was also the possibility that he was going to be putting the ABC network and more of the linear assets up for sale. That doesn't necessarily seem to be the case anymore. It seems as though he has rode those statements back. Um, he said that, you know, the networks still do have benefit to the wider enterprise that is Disney. But I think there are still a lot of questions question marks um, over Disney's assets. I think that analysts will be yearning to hear more about what's going to be happening with ESPN, whether the reported talks between that network and the NFL will lead to a deal. Mm -hmm. And it also speaks to wider m and in the sector that includes Paramount at the moment of the bid from Byron Allen. Yeah, and of course, we'll be keeping an eye on those developments. Thomas, really appreciate your joining us. Bloomberg's Thomas Buckley from L.A. telling us about Disney, which reports earnings this week. Meanwhile, IMAX reports in the coming two and a half weeks. And right now, analysts say it is well positioned to overcome some of the hurdles felt throughout the industry, like consolidation and stagnant box office numbers. Here in studio to tell us how the company plans to navigate those hurdles is Richard Gelfond. He is CEO of IMAX. Richard, so good to see you. Nice to see you, Scarlett. Um, of course, Oppenheimer was the big smash hit last summer for Hollywood and for IMAX, considering that Christopher Nolan shot with IMAX film cameras. Is it the gift that keeps giving? Is it going to contribute to the bottom line in the fourth quarter? Um, it, it's even contributing to the bottom line in the first quarter, um, because after all the Academy nominations, we released it, and IMAX film prints, as you know, are the, the magic way to see it. People love to see it that way. So we're still playing it out there. But I think, you know, it contributed a little bit in the fourth quarter, but most of it um, was in the third quarter last year. And it was fantastic. We did, as you said, almost $200 million. The film is closing in on a billion dollars. Yeah. And it's a no-brainer, right? A black-and-white biopic about a physicist. And yeah. We all could have called that early. <laughs> it boosted your revenue of 51% in the third quarter as well. What is the next big movie release on IMAX that could potentially move the needle for you in a similar way? Well, again, we're a platform for kind of all inspiring um, content. So whether it was like Avatar or mm. Oppenheimer, real visual audio experiences. So I think the next one is likely to be Dune 2, which comes out March 1st. And in Dune 1, IMAX did about 22% of the global box office on the opening weekend. And in the middle of the pandemic, we did $55 million on the movie. So I think there's a lot of following and it has a great cast. As you know, they've added Austin Butler and they have Zendaya. Is Timothy Chalamet T coming back? Timothy Chalamet is oh, coming Timothy, back. Timothy, so Timothy, right. I don't know which is. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, it's got star-studded cast and a recognizable franchise there. You know, I'm curious, how much of your time is spent identifying, scouting, and recruiting not just established directors, but also up-and-coming directors and cinematographers who will perhaps really take to the IMAX film format? Well, one really good thing that happened to us in the last several years is that a lot of them come to us. In the day, um, we really had to search out and uh, find directors. So uh, the director of Black Panther used to wait online at IMAX theaters and watch IMAX movies. And, you know, Chris Nolan is certainly evangelical. Yes. And then, um, you know, recently a lot more filmmakers like Kerry Fuganaka, who did the Bond movie, and a number of other directors... Uh, Chris McQuarrie is shooting the next Mission Impossible now on IMAX. So, you know, we interact and we know them, mm -hmm. but fortunately um, they, they come to us. Um, uh, I'm having dinner in L.A. with um, uh, Joe Kaczynski, who did Top Gun Maverick, right, right. and he's now doing an F1 movie starring Brad Pitt. So because of the success of Oppenheim and all those things, a lot of people really want, a lot of directors want to film in IMAX. You said you're going to be in L.A. I know you're based in New York, but you spent a lot of time in L.A., and you're going to be heading over there, presumably to stay through the Oscars. What's the track record of IMAX at the Oscars? Well, this year I can tell you that, obviously you mentioned Oppenheimer, but that got 13 um, nominations. But IMAX was involved in films this year that got 43 nominations for the Academy. And as a matter of fact, when, after it was announced, a couple of people said, is this the IMAXization mm. of, uh, of the Oscars? I think that would be getting a little in front. But I think especially for cinema files, it looks so good. And it, it really takes, makes people even like the movie more so in Dune to Denis Villeneuve, the director, mm -hmm. is using um, IMAX film in a number of theaters to show it as well. So I think, it, and it's a global phenomenon, by the way. Yeah. Last year was a record year for us uh, for foreign content, Japanese content, Chinese, Indian, and they're shooting with a lot of IMAX cameras now. So in China, we have four films in production now that are using IMAX cameras. 
So that, that's a definite growth area for you. You mentioned black and white biopic, that's Oppenheimer. Um, and of course, Dune is kind of like a sci-fi um, movie. What about music concerts? Because that turned out to be a big hit in the third quarter of this past year, whether it was Beyonce's movie or Taylor uh, Swift. Taylor Swift's movie. Is that the next big viewing experience on IMAX? I think it's one of the next big experiences. So I'm just, it, also we released the Talking Heads concert film, re-released it, Stop Making Sense, and it was mm -hmm. very successful. And then just in this quarter, we, re, we released a Queen concert film called Queen in, in Montreal. It was 40 years old, but we used all kinds of new technology to make it look spectacular. And we uh, remixed the audio so it sounded amazing. And um, we also did Andre 3000, which is kind of a listening thing this year. And the Queen concert became one of our biggest um, concerts that we've done of all time. And in fact, uh, as a personal fan of Queen, I couldn't believe that I could see Freddie Mercury from 40 years ago yeah. look that good and sound that good. So, I, And we're getting a lot of incoming on that. So from the big screen to maybe um, a, a smaller screen, but one that kind of envelops you, I want to ask you about the Apple Vision Pro, because there are a lot of headlines about Netflix and YouTube um, not offering apps on the device, yet IMAX is. What was your thinking? What, what, why does it make sense for your company? Well, first of all, we have a lot of um, uh, partnerships with Apple already. So we did Killers of the Flower Moon, we did Napoleon, um, as I mentioned, the F1 film, we're going to do with them. Um, second thing, the brand association. You know, mm -hmm. Apple is high quality the best, and IMAX is high quality the best. So they approached us, and we worked on an app to go on it, and we think it looks fantastic. And as I think about it, I don't think short term, a lot of people are going to be watching IMAX films on, on, on their it, Vision Pro. On the Vision Pro. But I, we've already been approached by some studios about saying, could we put 10 minutes on the Vision Pro oh, uh -huh. as kind of a trailer or a teaser so people want to go see it in IMAX? And I think it's one of those technology leaps where everybody hasn't figured out yet where it's going to lead. Right. But I felt like we needed to be part of it. So there's a lot of room for experimentation in terms of yeah, formats exactly. and time formats. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Rich, uh, Rich Gilfond is CEO of IMAX, and he'll be heading off to L.A. soon. So safe travels. Thanks, Scarlett. All right, let's take a look at how markets closed on the day. We started off lower um, and we ended down with the S&P 500 retreating a third of 1%. Yields moved higher across the curve. Uh, their tenure right now yielding 4.16%. The dollar continues to strengthen as the latest economic data suggests that the Fed uh, is not in any rush. And it backs up what Jay Powell was saying on 60 Minutes and certainly last week in saying that March is unlikely to see a rate cut. And crude oil finishing up about three quarters of 1%. WTI at 72.82 a barrel. This is the close on Bloomberg. Elanco Animal Health is selling its fish health unit to Merck, and the price tag is $1.3 billion. You can see there Elanco shares jumped on the news, finishing the day up almost 8%. Joining us now for more on this transaction is Elanco CEO Jeff Simmons. Jeff, thank you so much. And Elanco, because uh, it used to be Eli, Lilly, and Company, so thank you for clarifying that for us. Um, tell us a little bit more about this transaction. Why now? Why divest this business now? Yeah, this is a real opportunity for us to really concentrate our focus, Scarlett, into the bigger markets. We're sitting here, it's our 70th year as a company, um, but in that entire time, we're looking at one of the most historic pipelines ever. Six potential blockbusters in animal health, that's over 100 million in major markets. So we're going to lean in and concentrate in the pet health market, a $15 billion market, where we've got differentiated new assets coming, and a $10 billion cattle market, where we have a couple other blockbusters, where you look at a aqua business uh, and the entire market's about $450 million. So it's all about a concentrated focus, historic pipeline, where we're going to get greater earnings uh, and greater growth potential over the next couple of years. That's that's what today's about. You mentioned these six products that you plan to launch. Uh, that'll happen by 2025. It's part of the next wave of innovation for the company. What is the common thread uh, for these six products? They're all in pet health. 
Um, we've got uh, four of the six in pet health and two actually in the cattle market. And I think what's common is one, these are blockbusters. These are larger products, more than 100 million or more. Mm -hmm. uh, these are higher margin as a whole. They come in gr faster growth rate markets. So when you look at, let me just pick a few. One is we've got a new product coming, a JAK1 inhibitor in the derm market. Uh, atopic dermatitis, number one reason you go to the vet with your dog is usually because of an itching dog. This is a, um, a market that is growing. It only has a couple options for veterinarians, and we've got a differentiated asset. Uh, another one's in the $6.5 billion largest market, parasiticides, the tick, flea, heartworm, and we've got Credelio Quattro. It's going to be one of the broadest, if not the broadest, spectrum product in that marketplace. Um, so, again, many, many products that are coming in that are differentiated, large uh, markets, faster growth rates than, than the net company is today, uh, providing great opportunities. How much interaction do you have with pet health insurance companies? A lot of people are starting uh, to get or pay for pet health insurance, and I imagine that there's uh, negotiations taking place for the reimbursement of some of these uh, products and services. Yeah, not not so much. We, uh, you know, we actually focus heavily on the veterinarian as well as the pet retail market as well. And uh, a lot of this is just a, you know, we're we're a value based market. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things as we acquired Bayer here recently, we're the omni-channel leader with that acquisition. And what that allows us to do as a company is really meet more pet owners than any other company where they want to shop at the price point they want to shop. So we're launching a new monoclonal antibody uh -huh. that uh, is going to go after parvovirus. Uh, 800 to 900 puppies a day come down with this. There's no treatment. We're launching that product right now. That's in the freezer of vet clinics and actually going to take care of a virus that's deadly all the way to we're in the value stores at under $10 for uh, a flea tick option. So again, I would say we're value-based. We're an omni-channel leader, focus heavily on the veterinarians and the pet uh, retail market, all to get to that pet owner where they want to shop at the price point they want to shop at. Well, one thing that has been written about is that four years after the pandemic, um, after the pet boom, we've seen demand for pets slow down meaningfully. Um, more dogs are now being returned to shelters, unfortunately. And the pet industry as a whole is slowing down. It's still large, but it's slowing down. How is this showing up in your business? Yeah, I would say, I would come back and say the resiliency of the, the pet market has been significant. We've got an animal health industry that's grown 20 years in a row. Um, the five and 10 year CAGR is over 5%. You're getting price and volume. And what's behind this, and we still see this, and we see this coming into 2024. We we, we saw growth in Elanco in, in Q3. We guided for growth for Q4 of 23, and we're guiding for growth in 2024 with the backdrop of understanding that, hey, the, the expectation of care is high, mm. especially even for the Gen Z, the next generation coming. Behind that's a willingness to spend and the elasticity of that. And part of that is it rewards innovation. People are loyal to brands. Uh, veterinarians are part of that value proposition, so they're leaning in on this as well. Right. And then another one that's not talked about that I think is going to cause a lot more growth over the next couple of years is the globalization around this humanization of pet trend that we've seen in yeah. the United States. So, you know, seven, eight out of 10 homes have pets in the United States. It's it's 20 to 30 percent internationally. So globalization is going to keep the resiliency. So we're not seeing a slowdown gotcha. in our business given the, the portfolio. So I got to ask you quickly, Jeff, uh, final question to you. You mentioned how people are loyal to brands. Um, d does pet health also face the threat of generic competition? Will some of your medications uh, be subject to competitive, uh, the competitive offerings from generic drug makers? Yeah, the new pipeline that we have and a lot of the portfolio we have today is protected uh, with IP and patent protection like uh, like the human pharmaceutical industry. Mm. But I would say even when they come off patent, another great thing about the animal health industry, both on the pet side and even the farm animal side, is there's a loyalty to the brands, the science behind the brands. And, you know, another reason for even us coming in and acquiring Bayer, we're the second animal you know, second largest independent animal health company, been in the industry 70 years. We're in over 100 countries, Yeah. you know, yeah. 20 species of animals, lots of SKUs. So the barrier to enter into a very regulated business with multiple species right. is another reason why, you know, the generic competition's a little less uh -huh. and the loyalty to brands makes, you know, the resiliency of these brands even more.
Jeffrey, Jeffrey Simmons, CEO of Elanco, thank you so much for sharing um, all of that with us. And just a note on the Bloomberg, I'm noticing that 55% uh, of the revenue uh, for Elanco comes from overseas and about 45% from the U.S. Now, still ahead, what investors need to watch for tomorrow's trade? This is a close on Bloomberg. Tomorrow is a big, big day for those who've been following the aftermath of last month's Boeing disaster. Spirit Aerosystems, which makes parts for Boeing, is releasing earnings. On top of that, FAA Administrator Michael Whitaker is testifying before Congress. So let's bring in now George Ferguson, Senior Aerospace Defense and Airline Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. George, is Spirit Aerosystems earnings going to be similar to Boeing in which the numbers matter less than what the message it delivers to shareholders, to regulators and to customers? Yeah, I think so, right? So uh, in 4Q, Boeing has some decent production. I think you'll see that ripple through Spirit. Uh, it might not be, you know, the results for the quarter might be okay, although we're, we're looking for them to return to profitability in their commercial division and generate some good cash flow because they have a lot of debt coming due 2026. So they have to really start to generate cash flow they could, so they could prove to the credit markets they could pay that back. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think we're going to want to hear what the impact has been Due to these, uh, you know, due to the the Max Nine uh, issues and the increased FAA oversight, we're going to want to hear what that impact's going to be on production rates at Spirit, as well as their ability to earn, you know, profit in 2024. Yeah, like you said, returning to profitability is a big focal point for the market. Let's talk a little bit about the FAA administrator's uh, testimony before Congress. What will you be listening for? Well, so he's going to have uh, he's going to have to answer some questions on whether or not the FAA is fully staffed, uh, which will be very interesting because we think they're having problems there. They've had a lot of turnover during the pandemic, whether they can effectively uh, oversee the manufacturing process in commercial aerospace, which is Boeing and Spirit. Uh, and they're going to ask him about delegated authority uh, to Boeing, where, you know, where the FAA delegates some of the oversight to Boeing to streamline their ability to make aircraft. Uh, that will be interesting as well, because I think, you know, the sum total of both of those, uh, I think, is, a, you know, Congress wants more oversight at Boeing mm -hmm. and probably wants more FAA oversight. And that's going to slow down builds. That's going to add expenses. But but it's it's important right now because quality has slipped. Yeah. And quality is paramount right now. Safety exactly. is paramount. Sen uh, George Ferguson, our senior aerospace defense and airline analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you so much. It's something we'll be watching for tomorrow. Meantime, let's look ahead to what else is on tap for tomorrow. Voters in Nevada head to the polls for the state's primaries. We'll be all over that, and you'll want to stay tuned for balance of power. Also in Washington, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will be testifying before a House panel at 10 a.m. We will bring you headlines when that happens. And as we mentioned, FAA Administrator Michael Whitaker testifies to the House Transportation Committee Committee after the Boeing 737 MAX 9 blowout. That takes place at 10 a.m. Of course, plenty of earnings to go through. Before the bell, we'll be hearing from Eli Lilly. We'll be hearing from Hertz and, as we mentioned, Spit, Spirit Aerosystems. And after the bell, we'll be breaking down the earnings for you from Chipotle, Snap, MicroStrategy, and Ford Motor. Ford Motor obviously going to be a big one with all the questions about demand for EVs. That does it for the close. Balance of Power with Joe Matthew and Kaylee Lines is up next. Have a great weekend. Have a great evening, I should say. This is The Close on Bloomberg.